Well, good morning. Welcome to those of you that uh, this is your church home. We're glad you're back for another week. For those of you that's first time joining us, whether it's online someplace around the world or uh, just here, maybe you've come because you're part of the family dedication. Maybe it's the first time back in church in a while. I don't know. Good news is, roof did not fall in, no lightning bolts, so we're all uh, good right there. Maybe you come because you're sort of in that phase of sort of searching, kind of trying to find some answers to those questions that sur- swirl around in your life. Whatever the case is, I, I just want to know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're here and I'm happy that you're here. And if you're like me, you not only like being happy, you want to be happy, right? And there's something about all of us. We just, happiness is, in fact, the major driver in most of our decisions. It colors the choices we make. It, it kind of drives. In fact, it's almost like a, a hunger we have for happiness, especially in the United States. And the interesting thing about hunger, hunger only has one word vocabulary in its vocabulary. You know what that word is? More. Everybody say more with me, right? More, right? Because even though we say things like, you know, I could die happy right now, in a couple hours, you're ready, not quite ready to die, you want to get a little more happiness, right? We always want to be happy, and there's different things that make some of us happy. You know, some of us are, are driven to find happiness and sort of, sort of uh, our achievements. That's where we get our, our sense of happiness. So we work hard, and we work long hours, and we, we, we volunteer on all sorts of, because that's where we, had, we have this idea of achievement, of, of doing something. For some of us, it's, it's recognition, you know, and so we, we like it when people recognize us, and so we do lots of stuff. Some of us do crazy stuff, you know. We, we're the ones with the selfies that we're always in, the, you know, the, you know, we're always, because we want someone to recognize. We're, we're the first one to raise our hand. We're, the, we're always there because there's something that drives that way. For some of us, we find our happiness in being safe and secure. We don't like the idea of adventure and risk. We want to just kind of be safe. We're happiest when we're just left alone. And some of us are happy when we're out on adventures. Kind of that risk and that new and that, that makes, us, makes us feel alive. And we, we're happiest when we feel alive. And there's just so many things that, that drive this thing. But, but again, with all of this hunger for happiness, there's always this idea of more. It's always about more and more and more. Because think about it. What would make you most happy right now? Now, if those of you who just thought to be some other place, shame on you, shame on you. But you know, maybe you know that you got some bills, maybe you got some important meeting this week, maybe you got one of those kind of meetings this week that you wish happiness would be on the other side of that meeting. But there's something about us that drives us to keep looking for more and more happiness in more and more places. Because it works out, I mean, even when we say hunger, we think of food, and just think about it. Think about Thanksgiving, because if your Thanksgiving is much like my Thanksgiving, what you discover is you eat this meal, this huge meal, right? And typically in my family, when we do it, we, you have a seconds, you know, everybody gets a second plate. Then after second plate, we sit there around the table for another hour, hour and a half, talking and grazing, right? We're not hungry any longer. We passed hungry half a plate ago, but we're still, you know, it's Thanksgiving and we're eating. So we're about 4,000 calories now. What's another 1,000? We're going to kick a few more in. And then our family, we go take a little break. We go to another room because we can't sit this way any longer. We need to lay, you know, kind of lay to the back, you know. And we say words like, oh, that was great. I could not eat another. Right. And in about an hour, we come back to the table and we'll have like 10 pies. To which you say, I just want a taste of that one over there. And a slice, of that. just a small slice, just a small slice. And this one. And then you come back for seconds, the one that tasted really good, right? And you hope you get back for seconds before your brother or your sister gets seconds because they're looking at the same pie, so you want to get it through quick, you know? I mean, I mean there's something about this hunger in all of us, for, especially for happiness, that it's always about more and more. And even though when we get it filled and feel good about it, there's something else that kind of waits out there. And the reality is this. We think happiness comes from fill in the blank, and all of us have blanks that we try to fill in. But we have just kicked off this series called Crazy Talk, and this crazy things that Jesus said on this, this topic that's historically called the Sermon on the Mount. And so we kind of started at the end last week. This week we're starting to start, and the starting is this idea of the Beatitudes, what are called the Blesseds. 
Right, so we think happiness comes from these things, but Jesus says it comes from something very, very different. And he says, these are the kind of people that are happy, and I don't know about you, but if you've read through that list, you can stop and think, you know what? This is a little crazy. Because it's not the way we think. Those aren't the kind of things that we typically think would make us happy. But Jesus says those are really the people that are most happy. And so before we jump into it today over in Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and let's pray one more time together, okay? Lord, today we desire, because we are in this place, to get a sense that you're here with us. And not just sort of in these walls or in this space, but more importantly, because we're here and because you're here, that we're together with you in this. And so today, so today as we read these words that for some of us we've heard since we were children, the idea that we're blessed if we do this because of this was what happens. I pray that something would click today in a way it never has before. And that the result would be an understanding, but more than understanding, an experience of happiness with you that supersedes our hunger and our drive and our thirst for happiness in so many other places, so many other things, so many other desires and choices. So at this moment, I'm gonna assume because we're here together, that that's our goal, to meet God, to experience God, and to feel God. And so Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we invite you into this space now to speak to us in your name. Amen. If you want to join me, we're over in Matthew chapter 5, and if if you've read the start of it, it says basically this. Jesus is out there, he notices they're getting some big crowds that are following him, and because he sees the big crowds, he goes up on the side of this mountain, And he goes and sits down, and his disciples follow him up there, and the assumption is the crowd must follow him up as well, even though it doesn't say that, because at the very end, which we looked at last week, it says the crowds were amazed, and so they had to kind of hang around, as Jesus says these words. And this is a long, old sermon. This is the kind of bring your sack lunch, bring some snacks, because we're going to be here for a long time today kind of sermon. So here's how it begins. I'm actually going from the message paraphrase of the Bible today, simply because I think Eugene Peterson and his translation and and what we call a paraphrase there, I think captures the essence of what Jesus is after as he says these words. And partly is because for some of us, we have heard the word so many times since we were kids, that I think it's sometimes because we've heard it so many times, it doesn't reach us any longer. You know, blessed are the poor in spirit, and we think, okay, I'm not sure what poor in spirit is. So here's the words, according to Eugene Peterson, as he, uh, as he does his translation in the message paraphrase. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there are more of God and his rule. To which I have to imagine somebody in that crowd goes, uh, Jesus, question, because I, getting at the end of my rope is not the place to up. hold it. Save the thought to the end because we got a long ways to go, right? So he goes to the second one. And you're blessed, by the way. And the word in in the original language is happy. It's it's the idea of happiness, this kind of contentment that comes. You're happy, you're content when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you, which has to be a handful of hands go up, right? Really, Jesus? We're happiest when we, we feel like we've lost what's most dear to us? Because only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more and no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care Because at that moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. Which again, some hands have to go up and hold it dear Jesus. You know, I care about people, they don't care about me. What am I doing wrong? Hold it, save your thought. We're going on because you're blessed. When you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. This idea of pure in heart. Because then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. 
That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. Which again, some hands have to go up and think, really Jesus? I'm happiest when people are on me because of what I believe. That's why I kind of try to keep it quiet around the office, right? I want to make a big deal because I just kind of soon get through life and be happy, right? No, no, you're blessed. You're happy when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. You're blessed. Not only that, count yourself blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. And I love this. For they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. It's good to know somebody's applauding at that moment because you're not really typically applauding when that bad stuff's happening, right? And no. And know when all this stuff happens that you are in good company because my prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. To which Jesus still doesn't take their questions because he goes on to the next part. And we're going to cover the next part today. But we're just going to stop and look because we can't spend the whole time just going through that. Let's stop and think about these things because here's really what Jesus is saying. Blessed are you when you get to this point. This point of being poor in spirit, of of kind of feeling like I got nothing to bring to the table. I am empty spiritually. Blessed are you when you're merciful. Blessed are you not just when you're a peaceful person, but when you make peace, you intentionally try to bring people together. Blessed are you when it happens and that happens. Because when you get to this point, something happens. Then God can do something he could not do before. Now, I want you to think about your life for a second. Isn't that true? For those of you that are, that are followers of Jesus, that, that have had a faith experience, isn't that true for you? That it takes getting to a certain point, a certain understanding, even a certain willingness to kind of drop back and let things go, that has allowed God to do something that he, he couldn't do before, not because he wasn't powerful enough, but simply you weren't ready for it. You didn't have the mental capacity. You didn't have the spiritual capacity. You didn't have the heart capacity to deal with what he really needed, wanted to do, needed to do in your life because you weren't there yet. Blessed are you when you get to this specific area. And as Jesus goes down this list, and he starts off, it's an interesting place to start off. He basically starts off by saying, you know, when things go bad for you, when you feel bad about yourself, you don't feel like you're strong spiritually. When you feel like all you're doing is for everybody else and nothing's going good for you and everybody puts you down. By the way, that's a great place to be. Which is crazy, right? I'm not crazy in this, right? That's crazy, right? You're all looking like me. Where is he going? No, no, I'm simply, it's a simple question, right? It's crazy to say those kinds of things. But Jesus is saying it for a reason. He recognizes that we need to get to a spot, all of us, no matter what our religious experience has been, no matter what our background has been, if you've been raised as a Christian from your child, I look at Faith over here, you know, thinking about, you know, the possibilities for this young lady. Well, she's not a young lady yet, but she's going to, she's a really young lady now, but, you know, she's going to move on to that category at some point. And the chance to be raised in a home where both her parents love Jesus and live out that love. What better place would that be? But faith will still need some place in her life to come to a very important conclusion. And that is that no matter what her background is, she is not good enough. No matter how much she's surrounded by a strong family, how spiritual they are, that's not good enough. That all the things that she will learn from around her family and around her school experience and and around the people around her about what looks successful, how to portray yourself, what you're after, have this strong faith that doesn't ever doubt Jesus. What she will have to learn at some point that none of that matters, none of that is good enough. 
Because Jesus says happiness doesn't come from having a great family, which doesn't say it doesn't happen, by the way. Shouty. So that's good news, right? But it doesn't, happiness doesn't come from us. Happiness comes when we recognize that we are not and cannot be and will never be what we need to be. Because it allows him to do something that he can't do when we think we could do those things. When we think grace is simply, you know, trying to make up my little shortcomings here and there so that I'm always good and I'm trying to get up there so that grace, I don't have to use as much grace for, from Jesus because some of you need a whole lot more grace than me. Some of you a whole, whole lot more grace than me. You know, so I'm trying my best so he doesn't have to spend on me so he got plenty to spend on you. And I believe what Jesus is after is some kind of response as we hear these words. That we begin to understand that blessed, to be blessed, to be happy and, and from God's perspective, and even in our perspective, comes from a contentment. That it can never be and will never be about what I can do or what I bring to the table or how good I am. And none of those things are said not to make effort. None of those things are said not to try to be good. But it's that recognition that I can never do enough. Because when I recognize my need, that's when he can do something about it. So I'm going to walk you through three things I think Jesus wants us to do. Number one, hug or grip it. I put hug and grip it because some of you are not huggy types. And some of you are not grip it types. And I don't want to be sexist and say all the women are huggy types and all the men are gripper types. I would never say that. So whatever one kind of fits for you, but the idea is you need to grab a hold of something. And the thing you need to grab a hold of is this. I am not good enough. And Jesus, this is not about me being a mistaker. This is about me being a sinner. It isn't this I kind of come up short and I kind of shrug my shoulders. This is the idea that, 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 I, that I sort of embrace this, that I take full, this full on, that, that I am not and cannot be of my own. What God requires of me or even what I expect of myself. And this is not Jesus saying, you know, you know, you shouldn't strive, you shouldn't push, you shouldn't try to be the best. That's not what he's saying here. But we have to come to grips. That sin is a real thing. And it's a real thing that affects all of us. And it's a thing that we have to grasp on to the reality that, that we should feel poor in spirit. Not good enough because that's the best place to be. Because when we recognize that, then God can do something about that. It's when we think, I don't need you so much, Jesus. I got this okay. I don't need to pray about these little things. I'll let him just worry about the big things. See, the only way to experience grace is discover your need for it. And the reality is, for most of us, that takes time, actually a long time. I heard something this week, somebody talking about this, and they said that, uh, that Paul, from when he had this amazing conversion experience, you know, he was sort of real anti, anti-Jesus, and all of a sudden he had this, we call this Damascus Road experience, where he's knocked off this animal, and he's, he's blinded, this bright lights, all this kind of crazy stuff. It was like 13 or 14 years later, that he begins to write about grace. Begins to write about those, those things in our New Testament that for some of us we value so much. 13 or 14 years later, some of us have to throw off so much from our back, from our, our story, from our past, that it takes us some time. This is not an instantaneous thing, and it's not a one-time thing either. This isn't I got grace figured out. I'm all good now, you know? This is living with the reality that I always need it. Not only do we need to hug it or grip it, we also need to own it. And what I mean by that is that we need to get to the place where we, we don't just look at this as sort of, okay, that's what takes place, but, but look at it as I have to let the weight of the reality that I am not good enough, I will never be good enough, I need that weight to weigh on me 
and not simply be something I kind of shrug my shoulders and say, oh, well, I'm sorry. Because when we feel weight, we feel pressure. And when we feel pressure, something happens in our lives. You know that you grow, your body grows, strengthens itself when it feels pressure? That's what happens if you, if you, go, if you go to the gym, if you go walking, whatever that kind of stuff. You're, you're building pressure. You're putting pressure, and that's, that's doing something for your body. It's when we don't do anything, when we just kind of lay in our beds all day long. How many of you ever had this experience? You laid in your bed, you, you slept in that one day out of the year that you sleep in, you slept in way too long, you get up and you feel terrible all day. Anybody else have that kind of thing? You know? That's our body saying, you know, it's okay to get a little rest, but whew, that was way, way, way too much, right? You're killing us here is what your body's saying. No, you, you got to get put some pressure on it. See, if you, never, if you have never owned your sin, you have never experienced God's grace in its fullness. And for some of us in this room today and some of us watching online someplace, you have never experienced God's grace in its fullness because you have never come to the place of recognizing and owning your sin. It's our own self-preservation. We tell ourselves, I'm not that bad. And we typically find somebody that we can point to and say, see, I'll compare myself to them. You know, they're a whole lot worse than I am. So I'm not that bad. And it's amazing how that scale works, because if you're not really doing really well at all, you find a whole other group to point to, right? And the better you kind of feel about yourself, you'll even kind of raise the scale, because see, I'm getting even better and better, because now I'm looking at a whole other group of folks. But owning it is getting past this idea of justifying ourselves before God or explaining ourselves before God of wanting to raise our hands and say, ooh, ooh, God, call me because i got to explain this whole situation. I need to explain to you a reason for all this kind of stuff. It's getting past all that and simply saying, you know what? I am not only who you say I am. I am who I know inside I am. As much as I try to cover it up, cover over that I am a sinner. And even though in his eyes I may be a saint, a word, not a real experience, or saved, or whatever term we put on it, that does not change the other fact that I'm a sinner. And there's this constant battle. It's much like that idea of an appetite. It's much like that idea of hang, hunger. Defeat it. And the thing I've recognized in being a Christian the majority of my life now is that my, while my sin has changed, the fact that I'm tempted and still fail, sometimes willingly, the categories have just changed. Early on, it was you know, booze and drugs and girls. I don't do booze and drugs and girls anymore. I have one girl. It's legal now, you know. But it comes out in other ways, you know. And I've been around people who are no longer who they were, but they still struggle. So, in fact, the, the, the thing that oftentimes happens to people who've been Christians the longer you are, the thing that you struggle with most is pride. Because I got it figured out. And I really am so much better than you. Really, trust me on this. And this whole list of what we call the Beatitudes, this whole idea of what Jesus says, this is what's blessed, this is what it means to be, be happy. It's all predicated on our idea of, of, of grabbing this thing, of, of, of hugging this thing, of embracing it, of owning it, and saying, you are, you are exactly right, Jesus. You, because you are exactly right, I need to take this third step. But before I get there, there's this great statement from Corey Ten Boom that captures this idea. We cannot be filled, filled, we cannot be filled until we are empty. And we can't. And if you feel like you're full, 
And you got no, no room for anything. Which leads us to that third step. And that's simply this. To leave it with God. Because if you listen to what Jesus said in these eight statements, you'll be happy when you recognize you've got nothing spiritual to bring to the table. You'll be happy when you mourn over the fact that you weren't all that. You'll be happy when, you're, when your life gets purer and you recognize that the purity isn't earning you anything, it's just part of that happiness experience coming through. You'll be happy when you intentionally go about trying to bring people together, be a peacemaker, not just a peaceful person. You'll be happy when you give mercy to people. You'll be happy when you remember the other two, one of which is you'll be happy when you get persecuted. When people come after you because you're a follower of mine, he says. And you ought to be happy for that because, as Jesus said, that's kind of what happens to all my people. Important people. In their context, when he talks about, you know, the, these prophets and stuff, everybody would have gone, whoa, that's pretty good to be part of the consider, consider prophets. See, it's not how good is good enough. It's all about he is good enough. And that's why we leave it with him. Because there isn't anything you can do with it anyways. And that's what Jesus is after for all of us. Getting us to whatever the bottom place that we need to get to so that he can do in our lives whatever he needs to do in our lives. And the sense of contentment, the sense of happiness that comes from saying, you know what? I'm all in with you. Even though I don't understand it all, even though I don't have all the questions answered, even though it seems kind of crazy at times, I'm there because of you. See, most of us don't like bad news. We don't like people telling us, you're not good enough. In fact, some of us grew up in those kinds of homes. And, that, and for some of us, it went one of two ways. Either we began to believe the lie, and so we didn't become good enough. We, we, in fact, we followed that course. We're going to show you how bad we can be. For others of us, it drove us to be better and, we, and push harder and go farther. But Jesus seems to say in these eight statements that this is not the typical way you think about faith. And that's bad. That's bad news. Because it would be so nice to have a checklist, wouldn't it? Just have the Ten Commandments, the, the plain Ten Commandments, not Jesus' explanation that we're going to see over the next few weeks. Just the plain Ten Commandments, right? God first, you know. No images, I don't got any images of God because I have no idea what it looks like. Check, you know. And all down through the list, honoring your parents. Haven't killed anybody, you know, I don't got a murder rap on my record. Just know I've done what I'm supposed to do. And Jesus' point is, bad news is that's not good enough. But what make, the bad news makes the good news the good news because it reminds us again of just how amazing this offer of salvation and grace really is. This exchange that happens with I got nothing to put at the table and God puts everything at the table. Be able to throw it all out there. Blessed are you when you get to this point. 
Because it's the point we all need to get to. And we're going to get there either kicking and screaming or happily. Because God wants us to know just how good the good news is. So this is a question I told you we're going to ask every week um, as we go through this series. That is simply this. What do you most need to do but least want to hear? And what is out of these things that Jesus says brings happiness is the thing you least want to hear. And what do you, how do you need to respond to that? That's the question you have to take away with. Maybe the, another way to put it is, where are you missing him in your story today? And if you discover where you're missing him, what are you going to do about it? One of the great opportunities today is for you to say, I know what it is, and I know what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to call this person. I'm going to tear up that check. I'm going to do whatever that piece is. But I'm going to extend an offer to you today. If you would like to uh, sort of take the step of praying with somebody, just a few minutes as we wind up our service here today, there'll be some folks up here who would just love to pray with you. And that's what they're going to be up here for. And so if you'd like to just come up after our service, it'll be kind of quiet over here to this side. Just come up and tell them. Tell them I know what my thing is. I know where, where I'm missing him in my story. I know what it is I, I heard, but I need some help in doing it. They'll be glad to pray with you, all right? Also, I want to invite you to take out that Connect card that uh, Timothy talked about at the very start. Call it our uh, Connect card. Every week, we like to give people a chance to take a sort of the next step in a faith journey. And so here's three possibilities. Maybe your next step today is to embrace, admit, and leave my past, my present, and future with God. Maybe that's the important step you need to take. Maybe your next step today is to affirm that bad news can be good news. Or maybe your next step today is to ask yourself, what do I most need to do but least want to hear? Because that's an important question. And asking it is simply the first step to get into where you need to be. So I hope you make some kind of response in just a few moments. Some folks will come around with these little green or blue baskets. Why don't you just put that Connect card in there for your guest today. That's all we're going to ask from you. I want to encourage everybody to put that card in there because what it does is that uh, it encourages other people to put those cards in it. All right? And it's a great place to put some information for uh, pastoral staff, to uh, uh, have us pray for you, give us some information, maybe a new email or a new phone, new address. So we'd love to get that.